heard properly. And Lord, we pray you just bless this time of our study together. And we pray you bless our services this morning and this evening. And be with Brother Norwood as he preaches the word of God. God speak through, through him to us. Give us the grace to apply these things to our lives. And we ask these things all in Christ's name and for his sake. Amen. All right. Starting out in biblical dispensations, I want you to look with me over to Colossians chapter 1, verse 25 through 27. And here's what it says. Whereof I am made a minister, now get this, according to the dispensation of God, which is given to me for you to fulfill the word of God, even the mystery, now notice it's a mystery, even the mystery which hath been hid from ages and from generations and now is made manifest to his saints, to whom God would make known what is the riches of the glory of this mystery among the Gentiles, which is Christ in you, the hope of glory. Now it's evident that Paul is speaking primarily of the dispensation of grace. Throughout all the other dispensations, the dispensation of grace was a mystery. The Jews did not understand that one day God was going to save a great number of Gentiles. The Jews didn't understand that. And the text infers that there were other, there are other dispensations. Now, you know, I didn't learn about dispensations in Bible college. When I went to Bible college, they didn't even have a class for dispensationalism. I learned that on my own just by studying the Word of God. But anyway, in the last lesson, we considered the first three dispensations of God's order of events. The first dispensation is called the dispensation of innocence. Adam and Eve were in the garden. They didn't need to be saved. Why, why is it they didn't need to be saved? They'd never sinned. They had never sinned. And God gave Adam great knowledge to be able to name all of the creatures that God had created. And then when they disobeyed God, they fell spiritually. And this began the dispensation of conscience. And this is when Cain slew his brother Abel. This is when the people learned the arts and crafts. But this generation became very, very wicked. And God destroyed the world with a flood, Noah's flood, saved Noah and his family through the, the ark and so forth. And uh, this ended the dispensation of conscience, which is also called the antediluvian dispensation. And then began the dispensation of human government, the post-diluvian dispensation. This was... The time when the continent was broken apart and the continental drift began, Genesis 10, 25, it tells us that this was the time when Nimrod led the people to build the Tower of Babel. Remember God told them to scatter and repopulate the earth and he said, let us gather ourselves together. Let us come together as one people lest we be scattered. He was directly disobedient to God. And so they began to build the Tower of Babel. And their plan was on the top of the tower to put an altar there for the worship of Baal, the sun god, which is none other than the devil himself. And so God gave them confusion of tongues. And there God instituted over 2,000 different languages and dialects. And again, as I said in the last lesson, this disproves, without a doubt, this disproves the theory of evolution. And so now, we, as we continue this lesson, we see the dispensation of the patriarchs, or the family dispensation. And I'm going to ask Sister Giles to please read for us Genesis 12, 1 through 3. Now the Lord had said unto Abram, Get thee out of thy country, and from thy kindred and from thy father's house unto a land that I will show thee. And I will make of thee a great nation, and I will bless thee, and make thy name great, and thou shalt be a blessing. And I will bless them that bless thee, and curse him that curseth thee, and in thee shall all families of the earth be blessed. 
All right, thank you, Sister Giles. Now, notice he says, In thee shall all the families of the earth be blessed. Through Abraham came our Savior, Jesus Christ. And through him, everyone is blessed who will accept Christ as their Savior. And so the time of this dispensation extended from Abraham to Moses. This included Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, Joseph, and Moses. Now, this, uh, throughout this dispensation, we see the successes and failures of some of God's greatest people. Remember, Abraham believed God and was counted to him for righteousness. But his wife Sarah was barren. She could not have children. God had promised that through her would come the promised seed, which was Isaac. But anyway, Sarah talked to Abraham and she said, now I'm barren, I can't have children, but I want you to take my handmaid, Hagar, and through her produce the seed that will continue on. And so he did so and they produced Ishmael, the father of the Arab nations, which have been for since that time, they've been a thorn in Israel's side. Now, we see here that Abraham believed God and was counted him for righteousness, but he failed in this. And then Sarah conceived and brought forth Isaac. And Isaac grew up to be a fine young man. He married a beautiful young woman by the name of Rebekah. They lived among the Philistines. And the Philistine men saw uh, Rebecca and how beautiful she was and they wanted to take her for their wife and, and anyway uh, they asked Isaac said who is this beautiful woman he said uh, she's my sister he lied he lied she's my sister and so here Isaac failed God but through him and Rebecca they brought forth twin sons Jacob and Esau Jacob stole Esau's birthright. But God put him through some severe trials and God used him and his two wives, Leah and Rachel, to bring forth 12 sons, which were the heads of the 12 tribes of Israel. And so, you know, God is not a Democrat. He doesn't cover up our failures. He brings them out. That's what he does throughout the Word of God. We see people there that, that God used in a great way, but we see also their failures. And so, you know, God, God's not a Democrat. Amen? Now, this dispensation, like all the rest, ended in failure on man's part. The children of Israel were in the land of Egypt for 400 and some years as slaves. And when Moses led them out of that place, Across the, the Red Sea that God parted, those people, many of them, complained all the way to Mount Sinai. Yeah. They said, we want to go back to Egypt. We remember the melons and the cucumbers and the garlic and the onions and the leeks. And we want to go back there. And, uh, you know, by the way, in this I see a symbolism for Christendom. Because the night of the Passover, remember the blood was applied? That's a picture of our salvation. When they crossed the Red Sea, that's a picture of our baptism. The wilderness wanderings is a picture of all the trials and the disobediences among Christians and so forth. And when they come to the promised land, now I know some of you may disagree with me on this, but when you get to heaven, you'll find out I'm right. <laughs> <laughs> but you know in a lot of our songs they present the promised land as being heaven and so forth and you hear preachers preach on the, the promised land being a type of heaven when we get to heaven we're not going to be fighting giants we're not going to be fighting anybody up there and so what is the promised land I believe it's this. I believe it is a picture of the victorious Christian life. Now, you can disagree with me if you want to, but I love you anyway, all right? <laughs> I just wanted to bring that in. All right. Fifthly, we see the dispensation of the law, the legal dispensation. 
In Exodus 19, 8 through 11, Brother Giles, would you please read that for us? Exodus 19, 8 through 11. Thank you, Brother Tim. Now, here we see God in a thick cloud. Look at verse 18. Exodus 19, verse 18. It says, And Mount Sinai was altogether on a smoke, because the Lord descended upon it in fire, and the smoke thereof ascended as the smoke of a furnace, and the whole mount quaked greatly. Here we see God is unapproachable. The only one that could approach God was Moses. And Moses was a type or a picture of Christ. Now can we approach God today? Sister Monica, would you please read for us Matthew 11 verses 28 through 30. Thank you, Sister Monica. This is God's invitation. He opens the door so anyone can approach God through our Savior, Jesus Christ. Whether it be a saved person or whether it be an unsaved person. An unsaved person, when they come to Jesus Christ and God saves them, then they have access to Christ the rest of their life. And then throughout eternity. And so, in chapter 20... We see that God gave the Ten Commandments to Moses. There was a threefold giving of the law. Now, I've got some scriptures here that I don't have in the lesson, so I'm going to give them to you. You can write them down. First of all, it was given orally by God to Moses, Exodus chapter 20. And then it was given on tables of stone, Exodus 31, 18, in Exodus 32, 19, and when God cut out the, the tablets out of the stone and he put his Ten Commandments on those tablets, Moses was coming down from the mount and the people had a big party going. They were worshiping this golden calf and they were dancing around and drinking and boozing and no telling what else they were doing. Moses became angry and he threw those two tablets at the foot of the mount and they broke. And so that's what we see in Exodus uh, 31, 18 and Exodus 32, 19. Then it was given, the, the, the tablets of the Ten Commandments were given again the, the second time, but God said, Moses, you're going to have to cut these tablets out of the rock yourself. And then I'll put my Ten Commandments on them. And this is what he did. We see this in Exodus 34 and verse 1. And so here we see that there was a threefold giving of the law. Now after this was done, God added many other laws, rules, and regulations, judgments. Exodus 21 verses 1 through 3, we see his judgments concerning servants and injuries of individuals. And then they gave the annual feast. And this is seen in Exodus 23, verses 14 through 19. This has to do with the Sabbaths and their feast days. 
And then he gave the tabernacle and the sacrifices, Exodus chapter 25 through chapter 31. And here we see the tabernacle, the furnishings, and the sacrifices that God said that they should sacrifice to him. And then we see the priesthood and their garments. And the high priest was to wear a bonnet, a bonnet. He had a robe that had a, at the bottom of the robe around the hem of the, the, the garment was probably brass, maybe gold, pomegranate and a bell, pomegranate and a bell, pomegranate and a bell. The reason for that was when he was inside the tabernacle or the temple and he was officiating the giving of the, the putting the blood on the mercy seat and so forth, if he did something wrong, God would kill him. And so he had to adhere exactly to God's instructions. And when the bell stopped ringing, it was on the hem of his garment, the people outside knew he was dead. That it had a long pole with a hook on it. They reached under there and grab into his clothing and pull him out from under the out from under the, the veil. Now this is what Jewish tradition says. But anyway, he had a breastplate, had twelve different stones, precious stones in that breastplate. Each stone represented a tribe of Israel, twelve tribes, twelve stones, twelve tribes. Now, when we come to the Urim and Thummim, I'll give you a little bit of background about this. Joseph Smith, the one who started the Mormon church, he claims that when he was a young man, the angel Moroni appeared to him. He lived in a town called Elmira in the state of New York, and he said, the angel Moroni led me out to a hill and told me, he said, dig here. And he said, I dug and I found some golden plates. And he said they had writing on them, and I couldn't understand the writing because it was in some foreign language. But he said with those golden plates, there was a pair of spectacles, a pair of glasses. And he said when I put them on, everything went to English, and I could read it. And he said I read it, and I translated it into a book now called the Book of Mormon. And uh, so anyway, he said these glasses were Urim and Thummim. <laughs> he was so ignorant, he didn't even understand what Urim and Thummim was. He just read it in the Old Testament. But the high priest, inside of his vest, he had a pocket that went all the way through. Inside that pocket, he had a white stone and a black stone. And this is how they determined what God's will was. When they would come to a major decision, they didn't know whether to do it or not to do it. So they would pray and ask God to show them. The high priest would reach in that pocket. If he pulled it out, if it was a white stone, it meant God said, do it. If it was a black stone, it meant God said, don't do it. This is how they determined the will of God in those days. Now, these things have passed away because the dispensation of law has passed away. But some try to put us back under the law today. The seven-day Adventists, you know, they try to put us back under the law. Back years ago, there was this preacher on television, an elderly man by the name of Herbert Armstrong. Some of you probably remember him. He didn't believe there was a hell. He got too old to preach, and his son, Garner Ted, took over. And he believed the same way his dad did. He didn't believe in hell. And every year, they would offer a lamb and sacrifice to God for their sins. They bypassed totally the crucifixion of Christ. Now Christ fulfilled the law for us and he nailed it to his cross. Look with me over to Colossians. Let's go over to Colossians chapter 2, verses 8 through 14. Colossians 2, 8 through 14. Here's what it says. Beware lest any man spoil you through philosophy and vain deceit after the tradition of men, after the rudiments of the world, and not after Christ. For in him dwelleth all the fullness of the Godhead bodily. And we are complete in him which is the head of all principality and power, in whom also ye are circumcised with the circumcision made without hands in putting off the body of the sins of the flesh by the circumcision of Christ, buried with him in baptism, wherein also ye are risen with him, 
through the faith of the operation of God who has raised him from the dead, and you being dead in your sins and the circumcision of your flesh, hath he quickened together with him, having forgiven you all trespasses. Here it is, blotting out the handwriting of ordinances that was against us, which was contrary to us, and took it out of the way, nailing it to his cross. Now in Ephesians chapter 2, verse 15, it says, having abolished in his flesh the enmity, even the law of commandments contained in ordinances, for to make in himself of twain, that means two, one new man so making peace. Now the word twain here refers to two different groups of people, the Jews and the Gentiles. You know, back years ago, we were in Illinois at a church the pastor was a converted Jew, and I preached there, and anyway, a woman in the church invited Beverly, Marie, and I, and, and the pastor to her house for a meal, and so we went there, and she pulled out of the oven this big, juicy ham, and she had all the trimmings that went with it. We sat down, and I had prayer, and we started eating, and the pastor looked up at me, and he said, praise God, we're not under the law anymore. Now we can eat ham. And... <laughs> And so, you know, we're not under the law. And so now we come to the sixth dispensation, which is the dispensation of grace. Uh, Brother Phil, would you, I'm sorry, sister, sister, <laughs> sister Shirley, please back me up here a little bit. The dispensation of law also ended in failure. When Jesus came, they rejected him. John, Ed, John chapter 1, verse 11, Sister Shirley. He came to his his own received him not. He came, presented himself, him, and he performed all these miracles. And the Jews still did not believe in him. He said, I come in my Father's name and you receive me not. If another, talking about the Antichrist, if another shall come in his own name, him you will receive. And so here we see the end of the dispensation of law. And it begins the dispensation of grace Brother Phil, please read for us John 1, verses 16 and 17. And as Phil had all we received, grace for grace, for the law of him by Moses, for grace and truth came by Jesus Christ. Thank you, Brother Phil. Now this, this dispensation began with Christ. Some say the church began on the day of Pentecost. I used to believe that. But I got to study in the Word of God, and I believe the church started when Christ called out his disciples. They were empowered on the day of Pentecost, but the church was in existence before that. And so, you know, here we see 40 years of transition from Judaism to Christianity. This is where God gave the sign gifts, such as the, the gift of knowledge, the gift of healing, the gift of tongues, the gift is interpretation of tongues. Now, the question is, does God heal today? He can and he does, but he doesn't always choose to heal. And so the question is, does God give the gift of speaking in tongues today? Well, the Pentecostals say we speak in an angelic language. Now, that's not even in the Word of God. The, the word unknown tongue is... Uh, I'm trying to remember, it's a glacios... It means a foreign language. And so at Pentecost, they were speaking in foreign languages, not some gibberish. And you know, I believe there are instances, not very often, but there may be instances where God gives this ability for a person to speak in a foreign language that does not know that language. And God has a very specific purpose for doing that. I remember the story about a young fellow that was a born-again Christian. He joined the army during the Second World War. And he got to be friends with a young Navajo from the Navajo Reservation out in the state of New, uh, New Mexico or Arizona one. Anyway, they got to be good buddies and he would witness to this Navajo friend of his over and over again and the Navajo friend would say, I've got my own religion and you know, you're my buddy, but I've got my own religion. And so this Navajo fellow was trying to teach this Christian fellow how to, he tried to teach him the language of the Navajos. But he never could learn it. Some of those words are tongue twisters. 
and so it is in the language out on the, on the Colville Reservation. And uh, anyway, he never could learn the Navajo uh, language. So one day they were in a battle, and this Christian fellow was mortally wounded, and he was dying. And his Navajo buddy took his head in his arms, and, and, and he sat there and, and talked to him for a while. And this Christian fellow that was dying looked up at him and spoke to him in perfect Navajo language and said to him, my brother, you need to repent of your sins and receive Christ as your personal Savior. That's the only way you will ever make heaven. And then he died. That young Navajo accepted Christ because of that. That would be the only reason God would ever allow a person to do something like that. Now, this dispensation opened the door for all people to come to God. John 10, verse 9, Jesus said, I am the door. By me, if any man enter in, he shall be saved and shall go in and out and find pasture. Now, I'm going to ask Brother Russ to please read for us Ephesians chapter 1, verses 13 and 14. Thank you, Brother Russ. Now notice it says we're sealed by the Holy Spirit of God. The devil cannot break that seal. He can never lay claim on us again. Now this dispensation is the longest in duration. The Edenic dispensation lasted a short time. We don't know exactly the timeline on that, but other dispensations lasted about a thousand years, but our dispensation has lasted over 2,000 years years. This dispensation is also ending in failure. Many professing Christians, many professing Christians have tattoos all over their bodies, earrings in their eyebrows, in their nose, in their lips, in their tongue, no telling where else. We're living in a time when there's a great falling away. Young people today, they claim they're saved. They don't want to go to church. They don't want to read the Word of God. They don't want to pray unless they have a need for something. And then they might pray. But we're living in the days of the falling away. Brother Dunn, would you please read for us 2 Timothy 4, 3, and 4. That's where we are today. Thank you, Brother Dunn. That's where we are today. And you know, it's sad that every dispensation ends in failure as far as man is concerned. Now we come to the seventh dispensation, which is the dispensation of the kingdom. And uh, let's look over at Ephesians chapter 1 and verse 10. It says that in the dispensation of the fullness of time, that's talking about the the seventh dispensation. It says, He might gather together in one all things in Christ, both which are in heaven and which are on earth, even in Him. Now notice it says the dispensation of the fullness of times. This will be the seventh dispensation. The number seven is God's number of completion. In the study of numerology, the number one is God's number. God is one God. The number two is God's number for division. The number three is God's number for the Trinity, God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit. The number four is God's number for creation. We have summer, fall, winter, and spring. And we have four directions, north, east, south, and west. Four is the number of creation. Even the Indians know that. Now, also, we find that the number five is God's number for grace. In front of Solomon's temple, there were five columns. Picture of God's grace. And you know, Beverly and Marie and I, we went with our kids over on the coast and 
Washington back years ago, we found a bunch of sand dogs. We broke the top of those off, and you know what's inside? Four little beautiful white bones in the shape of doves. Five of them. A dove is God's symbol for peace. The number five is God's number for grace. We see this throughout the creation. God put his number five in a lot of things in the creation. And then we see the number six. This is the number of man. During the tribulation period, the number for the Antichrist is going to be six, six, six. And the number seven is God's number for completion. During this dispensation, many things will be restored. I'm going to ask Beverly to read for us Psalm 67 and verse 6. Amen. And that's during the millennial kingdom of Christ. Now, Sister Patty, please read for us Joel chapter 2, verses 24 through 26. And the floor shall be full of wheat, and the fat shall overflow with wine and oil. And I will restore to you the years that the locust has eaten, the canker worm and the caterpillar, and the palmer worm, my great army, which I sent among you. And ye shall eat in plenty and be satisfied. And praise the name of the Lord your God that has dealt wondrously with you. And my people shall never be ashamed. Amen. Now that's, talking, that's not talking about today. That's talking about during the millennial kingdom of Christ. Now, during the millennial kingdom, the animals will not eat one another. The Bible says the lion and the lamb will lie down together. Now the only way you see that today is if the lamb is inside the lion. But you know, during the millennial kingdom, it says that the lion will eat straw like an ox. And it says, a child shall put his hand in the cockatrice den. A cockatrice is the most venomous cobra in the land of Israel. And it says, the little child is going to put his hand down in there and play with that cobra. And it's not going to hurt him. It's not going to bite him. Probably not even going to have fangs. And then we see that human life is going to be prolonged. You know, in Isaiah 65, verse 20, it says the child should die at 100 years old. It's talking about a, not a little child, talking about a, an adult and maybe a teenager. It would be comparable to a teenager today when he's 100 years old. If he gets killed, you know, I mean, accidentally, I mean, he would die. And, uh, he, but he, at 100 years old, he'd be considered a child. And so evidently people are going to live to be eight and nine hundred years old like they did between Adam and Noah. And so then, you know, there are those that believe that God's going to restore the canopy that once touched down at the North Pole and the South Pole and was out about two miles at the equator, which filtered out the ultraviolet rays of the sun and, and uh, uh, actually produced a hyperbaric pressure here on the earth. And you know, hyperbaric pressure is amazing. I, I met a, a guy at a church in Kansas, and he was telling me about that. We was talking about hyperbaric pressure. And he was telling me about a guy that he knew that had a big canker sore on his leg, about that big around. And he said he'd been to every doctor in the area, and they couldn't get it to heal up. So they sent him to the Mayo Clinic up in Minnesota, and they put him in a hyperbaric chamber for three days and three nights, and it completely healed up. And Dr. Carl Ball, the administrator of the Christian Science Museum down in Glen Rose, Texas, he built a hyperbaric chamber. And he took a box of mice that he caught in live traps, and he dumped them in that chamber. Then he went and threw a couple of rattlesnakes in there. And he said the first three days they ate those mice, but after that there were still some mice alive. They said those rattlesnakes quit eating the mice. So he waited another few days and he took those rattlesnakes out and he milked them and he said their venom was no longer poisonous. He said then it was pure protein. It's amazing what hyperbaric pressure can do. And so we find here that this dispensation will also end in failure on man's part, never on God's part. 
Sister Lisa, please read for us Revelation 20, verses 7 through 9. And when the thousand years are expired, Satan shall be loosed out of his prison, and shall go out to deceive the nations which are in the four quarters of the earth, Gog and Magog, to gather them together to battle, the number of whom is as the sand of the sea. And they went up on the breadth of the, of the earth, and compassed the kings of the saints of battle, and the beloved city, and fire came down from God out of the heaven and back. Thank you, Sister Lisa. Now remember, the devil has been in the bottomless pit for a thousand years during the Millennial Kingdom. At the end of the thousand years, he will be turned loose and he will go throughout the earth and deceive the nations and bring about the second great battle of Armageddon. And then God will destroy all of the ungodly. Now how, how's, how's it going to be that there's going to be ungodly people from the Millennial Kingdom? We need to remember Many of the people that go through the tribulation are going to go into the millennial kingdom. Only the saved people go into the millennial kingdom. But they're going to have children. And those children are going to have to accept Christ as their savior to be saved. And as generation passes generation and generation passes generation, there's going to be a great falling away again. Many of those young people that are born again that are born into this world will not accept Christ as their Savior. And so when they get mature, they're going to be warriors, they're going to go into this great battle, and God is going to destroy them throughout the, throughout the earth, and then he's going to establish a new heaven and a new earth. Now God will prove, in all of this, God will prove that without God in the heart, man will fail at anything he tries to do. That's why God is dealing with the human race in a different manner in very specific periods of time. All right? Now, does anybody have a question? Yeah, Sister Giles. You said the cockatrice was a kind of snake? Yeah, it's a cobra. Really? Because that was on a crossword puzzle thing, and I didn't know what it was. I looked it up. Webster said it's fictitious or something. So that, that surprises me that it's a snake. No, uh, Webster's wrong on that one because the Bible says a cockatrice. Right. Well, that just proves that Webster is wrong. Yeah. He wasn't inspired of God, but, I mean, he, he did a lot of good work. He was born again Christian, but uh, he should have read his Bible. <laughs> but a cockatrice is the most venomous cobra in the land of Israel. And so anyway, next week we will start on something else. I'm thinking about the study of angels. You pray for me that God will show me which what he wants me to teach on. All right? So anyway, let's be dismissed in prayer. And I'm going to ask uh, Brother Dunn to dismiss us in prayer if he would, please. Father, thank you. Amen. Amen.